So first of all, welcome. What a great day, what a great celebration, and thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Bridget Shim, and I'm a member of the Daniels faculty. Uh, and this is the first session of a whole series for a wonderful day, uh, really looking and reflecting on the accomplishments of the school. So I've been told before we get started, I want to take a moment to thank our friends at Herman Miller, who have provided the furniture for this discussion, and we appreciate the opportunity to showcase Herman Miller's award-winning designs. <clears throat> so, for me, I <laughs> <clears throat> So I am really honored to be the moderator for what I think is a really important session uh, at this 25th anniversary of the school. So for me, Jerome Markson and Barry Sampson are two significant architects, urban designers, and citizens of Toronto who have made an enormous contribution to our city. They are both stellar graduates of the University of Toronto's program in architecture and it is truly an honor to really help to shape what I hope is a really lively and engaging conversation that starts in the school, in the university, and then extends and ends in the city. Uh, <clears throat> Jerome, Barry, and I met uh, before this event over lunch. We had an, a wonderful conversation, and in a way there were many interesting things that were revealed. So I want this to really be more of a conversation as if you're eavesdropping on our lunch and you get to hear all the juicy bits that we talked about. <clears throat> and in a way, um, the kind of meatier part of the conversation is that in my view, the work that takes place with our students in this school of architecture, landscape architecture, and urban design is not just an academic exercise divorced from reality. My thesis is that this innovative ideas that are explored in this school <clears throat> and are investigated throughout this university should shape the future of our cities. And so this is the real question that I want to pose to these two exceptional graduates of our school, Barry Sampson and Jerome Markson. And I would really like our conversation to link their time in this school at the university and whether the kind of discussions, the conversations shaped or had any impact on their role as distinguished practitioners. And to understand this vice versa, this back and forth between the academic world and the practicing world of architecture. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm just going to begin um, with a very short introduction for Jerome Markson, who was born in Toronto uh, <clears throat> and graduated from right. the school in 1953. He worked in partnership with Ranji Bura and Ernie Hodgson and presently continues as a sole practitioner. He's a fellow of the RAIC, Royal Architectural Institute of Canada, Toronto Society of Architects, and really has been a kind of really important contributor in so many ways. He's earned a Toronto Arts Award for Architecture and Design in 2001, and then the Ontario Association of Architects Lifetime uh, Design Achievement Award in 2014. In 1972, Jerome was really one of the guiding forces behind a wonderful publication called Exploring Toronto, which was written with fellow architects, sponsored by the TSA, and was the first real architectural guidebook in our city. Uh, in our luncheon, we decided we, that this is a visual crowd, and so it's really important not just to say words, but to actually use images to highlight really what I think are the key accomplishments. <clears throat> so first I wanted to show, um, for, on Jerome's behalf, the Monk residence. I was a recent graduate living in a rental apartment in Midtown Toronto. In one of my regular walks, <clears throat> I came across this amazing renovation. I would say I was kind of uh, <clears throat> so, um, it was so unexpected in this neighborhood in Toronto. It was austere, it was refined, it was sophisticated in its building elevation, and I needed to figure out who worked on this project, who designed it. And then I learned that it was not only Jerome Markson, who was the author of it, um, but really a, a project that you know, is what many architects start with, a renovation, but I think the kind of, uh, kind of thinking about this front elevation, the front on the street, I think was really um, just such an eye-opener for me. <clears throat> In a way, um, there's a whole series of projects. This is just one image of a series of truly elegant designs done by Jerome Markson, many of them in the Hamilton area. Um, and in a way, this one is a steel frame pavilion uh, overlooking a ravine. It's truly, for me, a modernist essay using barrel vaults, steel and glass to shape light. 
And in a way, at this time in 1959, I would say he was one of several people forging a new territory, a kind of radical statement about architecture and its possibilities, a huge optimism about modernism, and really engaging this area in a kind of larger conversation about modernity. <clears throat> this is an image from 1962 project, a health center in Sault Ste. Marie, also designed by Jerome Markson. Um, there was a student in the office named George Baird who worked on this project, and then a recent graduate. So there's a kind of whole totality here. This project received a Massey Medal in 1964, but, al but also was truly an innovative type, as opposed to a mega facility, really rethinking what a healthcare center could be, and I think really um, important as a contribution to the discourse about this building type. <clears throat> In a way, um, Toronto has had many stages of evolution. And in a way, the kind of St. Lawrence is a really interesting project where both Barry and Jerome have been involved with. Barry, while working with George Baird, uh, really commenting and really reflecting on the urban design principles. And then Jerome is one of the many skilled architects designing urban housing, using red brick to create townhouses, flats, rental units, and really making, in effect, not just buildings, but a neighborhood really linking urbanism and architecture together. Uh, <clears throat> so I think that it's really re reflective of the tip of a whole body of work that we can point to uh, where this approach, this attitude to city building is germane and integrated. So also, I mean, we all know that urban housing is such a key part of making a great city. Um, and Jerome has spent so much of his career not only reinforcing these neighborhoods that his projects are in, but really highlighting important pieces. This is Market Square, 1980, a stellar example of the role that, that fabric can play in recognizing heritage buildings like the St. James Cathedral and enhancing the public realm. So you look at a whole career that has co-op housing rental housing, urban housing, social housing, mixed-use complexes that really have addressed many of the challenges about what it's like to live in the city and how important it is. So in a way, it's sort of like a visual um, introduction to Jerome, and I just want to pass it over to Barry, who will also continue on. Maybe, uh, <clears throat> and you can um, hear from Barry. Just one second. Thank you, Bridget. I'm going to read a little bit of the first part of this um, and then just talk extemporaneously. Uh, Bridget posed the thesis, the work and ideas that take place in the schools of architecture should shape the future of our cities. And I wanted to add a corollary. Each of us is imparted with a certain energy of character and intellectual momentum that we bring to the university and that is given ultimate destination and shape by our caroms off the embodied and intellectual energy, intellectual energy and creative trajectory of others. Where that contacting energy is of great integrity, its effect on our own direction and intellectual transformation is great. I'm, Jerome Markson is an architect of great integrity and commitment to the discipline of architecture whose positive contribution to architecture is not only through his work but also his effect on people. My meaning with respect to the carom will I hope become clear as I talk further. Uh, this is a bit of a tribute to Bruce Cobera, who, who I bunked with in first year and would steal out at night to play pool. Yeah, okay. I went to school in 1967 to 72 during a full-blown generational conflict of beliefs in the modalities and institutions of society that was having a profound impact on the university itself. Fundamental questions of theory and practice of education playing themselves out in the revolutionary new curriculum of the program and architecture of which my class was both the test bed and vanguard. A growing crisis in the belief and practice of modernism, both in respect of its perception in society and its role in the formation of the city where it was allied with forces of capital in fragmenting urban pattern and neighborhoods. A sense of the cultural recontextualization of architecture moving from its past within the practical sciences to new reference points in cultural criticism and practices, including and most especially film. This is a, 
a picture of me and my colleagues making a film in the Eastern Harbor in 1971. A vibrant university community exhibiting a vigorous post-war world, uh, out, uh, outward world orientation was casting off habits and outlooks of British imperial and colonial culture while being wary of American imperial outlooks, outlooks following in its wake. There was a kind of nascent Canadian nationalism occurring at the time. The, the image on the left is in fact my fourth year project for institutions in the city on the very left hand, water left hand side of that street, you can see classic block busting of the pattern on uh, St. George of Mansions that was done by the University of Toronto to build the, um, the, the um, Central Research Library, the Graduate Research Library. I was posing an alternative of a modular infill housing system uh, elevated over top of a kind of free ground plane that would be available for um, uh, a variety of uses, most especially educational uses. <clears throat> um, from when I graduated, I, I didn't realize until I was doing this kind of reflection the extent to which I graduated as an angry young man, um, which was partly reinforced by a trip that uh, a number of colleagues and I took to Latin America, where I saw what, what happens when you have a society with 5% of the population owning 95% of its wealth. <clears throat> Came back to Toronto and, um, well, actually when I graduated, I joined uh, George who was already uh, involved with a, a group of students who had assembled around him to do competitions. We thought we would transform the world. We did a lot of back porches. <laughs> this is one of them. This is one of them that I, I played a, an important role in designing, and in that respect, I think of it as, as kind of my, my, my uh, first project, testing out things. Uh, we, we, did, we did no limits, so I did curved doors, slope sliding doors, uh, double cantilevered stair. It was for a wonderful client who was a much beloved um, Toronto film editor, Don Haig, who was uh, outwardly gay, uh, he had been to New Orleans, was inspired, and said, I want to do a steel porch, a steel building like in New Orleans. I think we can do it in the backyard discreetly in conservative Toronto, which we did. Um, at the same time, in the office, there were groundbreaking um, research projects that were be done, being done in, urban, in urbanism led by George. I've spoken of them in more detail in the... Uh, the, the lecture I did on Curious George for the, the tribute to, to George, so I'm not going to talk about them here. But I did want to mention that, that George understood the importance of uh, open discussion and exposure to a broad range of ideas and travel. And so he actually fundraised so that a number of us could go to the International Institute of Design uh, called the uh, Architecture Association Summer Session, um, which was organized by Elvin Boyarsky in London. And one of the contributors to that, one of, a generous contributor to that was uh, Gerald Markson. George always talked about how important Ger Gerald had been to him as a mentor. So the three people that went were Bruce Kuabara, Howard Greenspan, who recently is deceased, and myself. And this was a was just, for me, it was, a, it was both a, a kind of paralyzing and eye-opening um, exposure to the kind of ideas that were not being discussed in the school that I was part of. There were, there were presentations by Peter Cook of Archigram, Cedric Price, Co-op Himmelblau, he was called, they presented themselves as Co-op Himmelblau at the time, often called Coop Himmelblau now, uh, Paul Oliver, who um, I particularly enjoyed, architectural historian and musicologist, did a whole lecture series on music. Um, Ram Kohlhaus and Bernard Schumi made presentations. They are recent graduates of the AA, and I think you know what kind of careers they've had. Um, I worked with George until 79. Uh, Toronto is a very conservative city. You can only do so many back porches. And I left the practice to go to Paris to figure out what an angry young man who was unemployable like me could possibly do next. Um, 
fortunately, George came over and proposed that we set up a, up a partnership, and so I came back, and the first thing we did was um, the uh, Edmonton City Hall competition. Um, I, I've decided I would emphasize drawings in this uh, presentation because our students draw and because the whole mode of representation has changed uh, so much over the course of my career. So these are drawings from the Edmonton City Hall competition. This was a, our idea was a critical approach. It was a rule of the competition that the original City Hall, which is in the middle of the composition, uh, it was inspired by Le Corbusier, but interestingly enough, had embedded in it the, uh, the crank geometry of the original settlement grin. We decided we would keep the City Hall. We were unceremoniously uh, bounced from the running of the competition, but the project became a cost lever and was, was uh, broadly published and, uh, and led to other opportunities. Another competition, the Trinity, Trinity Square Park, which I think is is so appropriately named for a city like Toronto, a square park. We decided not to do a square park. <coughs> uh, that we would do another critical project that would uncover the, the sort of primordial condition of the city, uh, the mythic uh, Tattle Creek. And then uh, we started a, an interest in, uh, in uh, a condition of public space that was uh, topographic vertiginous and could bring you up into the city in unusual locations. So we added this constructivist uh, tower that would allow you to, to both look at the park and Trinity um, and uh, the historic Trinity Church. On the, on the right side is a sketch I had done when I was in Paris. I, I did research in Paris and the interplay between evolving ideas of the garden and, uh, and French uh, urbanism, which had a significant impact subsequently on my own thinking. Um, the, the jury for Trinity Park was very keen on our creativity, but very worried about the insalubrious behaviors that our project might solicit, and thus we, were, we, we lost. But uh, it did um, lead to us being invited to do the Trinity, uh, to, to do the um, uh, Bay Adelaide Park uh, competition which in fact we won. And this is a, a rendering uh, that was done uh, between um, uh, myself doing the, the perspective drawing, constructed per perspectives. You remember, those of you of my age and older probably remember when we constructed. So I, I got to construct the perspective mm -hmm. and Tony got to do the walk-on um, render which gave it this beautiful um, kind of evocative uh, character. I'll tell you, <laughs> I spent a lot more labor on the drawing than Tony did. Um, uh, this project was a kind of continuation of the of a sort of critical interest in the city, and um, an interest um, that that you know wasn't part of the early modern modernist project, which was to reconnect the various generations of the city in a project. And so we were interested in the city as a process of construction, deconstruction, reconstruction, and also a kind of recognition of the invasive and persistent nature. Um, character of, uh, of nature in the, in the project. This project um, was also very controversial with some city officials and they delayed the announcement but uh, it eventually capitulated to the inevitable and announced that we wanted, we, we then built it. It led to quite a number of, of other projects, institutional projects. Uh, I thought we'd, we'd sort of arrived and made it. Um, we, we did a number of uh, master plans for some of the great um, universities that were created in the 60s. This is a, a rendering I did of a reconstruction, a kind of new glass canopy reconstructing an earlier wood bower by the brilliant architect Ron Tom for Champlain College. Ron Tom, by the way, was the winner of the Trinity Park. His team was the winner of the Trinity Park, uh, Trinity Square Park competition at a time when he was in the sort of twilight of his career. But, but uh, Champlain College was most certainly when he was in the robust center of his career. It led to quite a number of other um, institutional buildings. So in that particular case, as, as a master planner, we're interested in kind of urbanity of movement through the campus. In this one, which is the Arendelle Hall, we, were, we raised the, the residence, we took the program, um, uh, we raised it up above um, a new um, colonnade, which is a kind of uh, homage to Le Corbusier. 
and, um, and then strung the social uh, facilities along it to create a condition of, um, of both activity and amenity. We, we were also very interested in, um, I, sh I should say that in my first project that I did, the one that I showed you in first in, uh, when I was in fourth year, I did a lot of sun analysis to, to arrive at the pattern. And um, there's been a persistent interest in our project in the environmental performance of buildings. And Arendale Hall was, was one of a number of high performance buildings we did. Uh, this is uh, another competition winning scheme that we did um, called um, Old Post Office Plaza in St. Louis. Um, and in this particular case, we were interested in the whole urban narrative, which I won't go into here, um, surrounding the mythic figure of Daedalus, because the, one of the components of this was we were required to have a, a uh, there was a large uh, public uh, art piece called the, the Torso of Icaro, which was um, to be located in the park. And so when we did research in Daedalus, we discovered, in fact, that he's associated with the beginnings of urban planning. <clears throat> We're now, um, and I would say, in a, once again, a conservative environment. I, institutionally, uh, the provincial government has, made, has enacted procurement policies that make it difficult for a small and slightly weird firm like ours to persist, but uh, persist we do. Uh, this is a project that we're doing. Uh, so we tend to get large institutional or medium-sized institutional projects that have unusual programs or, or technically uh, challenging programs. This is the Schulich School, expansion to the Schulich School of Business that we're doing. It, it has a very, very ambitious um, environmental program, and one of its features is this uh, 50 meter high solar chimney, which will actually drive uh, passive ventilation of uh, classrooms. This is a central social space that's part of that project, and I should say it's attached to the wonderful building that um, CMAC Hariri, who's here in the audience, uh, designed. And then we're also returning to doing houses, which we haven't done for a very long time. Um, although we started out doing back porches, this, this is a, a, what I call a light mass, which is a, a house inspired by passive solar design. It has a continuous solar chimney. It's all made of concrete because the clients, and there, you can see them there in the garden, they dreamed of having a house in the Caledon Hills where they could grow their own vegetables. One of the features of the project is it has a chicken coop. Um, but one of the other features of it, it's all made of concrete because they're Polish immigrants and they don't like wood construction. How they hired us, I'm not sure, but they're wonderful clients and uh, so we're enjoying doing these kinds of, of buildings. The point that I wanted to make in concluding here is that while my Relationship to, to Gerald has been tangential. It is a carom of great significance. If, if um, Jerry had not had the influence he had in George, who's had, of course, a profound influence on me, and George, in many respects, was my thesis advisor postgraduate, although I never went to graduate school. I went to Georgia school. I probably should get three PhDs. <laughs> I, 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 was, I sat through the entire writing of The Space of Appearance, which was an education in itself. Anyway, <clears throat> if Gerald hadn't had his influence on George, if he had not contributed to um, our uh, sojourn in England, um, oh, I would be a different be. person doing different work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, I, want, well, I want to begin by thinking about what it was like when you were in architecture school. And I know, Jerry, you were in a kind of post-war period that we weren't even on the main campus. And maybe you could begin by describing what it was like to be uh, a student in the University of Toronto School of Architecture at that time. Okay. Um, I guess I can speak to that. But I, I, I really want to tell the story of how I became an architect. Uh, anybody ever thought about how they got to be an architect? What idea what was put into their head? I was coming down our stairs um, at, in our home when I was about in fourth form high school. And my brother, who was studying medicine at the time, 
later became a psych- psychoanalyst, was speaking to a dental student of his age, so about five years older. And then I heard the friends say, and Jerry, what's he going to be? <laughs> and my big brother said, Jerry's going to be an architect. <laughs> not know what that was. <laughs> and I went to the old library on College Street, which used to be the main library. People know that. Um, and I uh, found a battered book by Frank Lloyd Wright and uh, promptly fell in love with it. Uh, went to Buffalo to see those wonderful buildings, which were about to be demolished because the city of uh, Buffalo didn't give a damn. But, as you know, uh, the Martin building was torn down, but the, the house for the Martins uh, finally is turning into uh, being completed. And it surprises, to, surprises me, but some of my friends love it, and some of them say, oh, I don't, I don't like that. And I mean architect friends. Anyway, uh, so what happened was, and I think you'll all be interested, it, is that uh, the war ended in 45, we were kids, um, and the boys were coming back from the war. And if you qualified, the Canadian government uh, paid for your schooling to go to college, to go to university. So the class was like 145, and I'd say at the most, uh, 50 or 60 graduated it was tough for them because of what they'd been through and they'd forgotten how to ram facts into their head and all that sort of thing. Um, so, But you weren't even on the St. George campus when you started. No, no, I, so. I, yeah. So uh, the, the point here is that there was not room for the burgeoning uh, needs for space for the uh, students coming back. And, uh, and from, because of the war. And so there was a munitions factory in Ajax, and I don't know if some people will know that, a gigantic munitions factory with sheds and buildings and big pipes that went over roads and so on, insulated a little bit. And that became the first year of architecture and the first two years of engin- all engineering studies. And um, it was incredible. The first, and I will finish with this little part of my talk, uh, by saying that on the very first day, Colonel Medill was the head of the school at the time, a very sweet, nice, lovable man, a very kind. He taught us plumbing, by the way. We had a course in plumbing. Uh, can anyone else here say they have studied? Plumbing. We had a course of. Even I didn't study plumbing, although I studied. Not old enough. Had eleven. No, we had a number of engineering courses our first year, but not plumbing. Well, the colonel, uh, who, who, as I said, is a very nice man, uh, looked out at this array of 145 people, and he said in the nicest way possible, and I will never forget it. uh, I see two young ladies in the audience. So this is your first year class. Um, this is first year. We were it's only like the, there for one it's like year. It's like the first day of your first year. No? First day of the first year. And architecture is part of engineering. Oh, yes. The practical yes. side. Yes, that's right. Discipline, right? So that's right. The engineering school broke away, what, 30 years ago? Something something in there. And he, gave, he said, I see two young ladies in the crowd, and I advise you to leave the course now. Is that sinking in? <laughs> okay, and, he gave, and he gave the reasons why they should. They were going to have babies, they were taking a man's place, and all that stuff. And I'm going to add to that. So we looked at Jerry brought the, um, he had a catalog that the school had produced that of the funny. names of all the graduates. And so we checked the, um, the, the names of the graduates in my year. In my year, there were no women who graduated. In the year after my year, there were no women who graduated. The following year, I think it was 74, there were four or six women who graduated, something like that. And you have to put that in the context of 
of between when Jerry was in architecture school and when I went to architecture school in 1968, the University of Toronto tripled in size. The university capacity of Canada doubled. So basically the university system was created in Canada during that, that period as well as all the programs that made it accessible to a broader range of people. And it started with military men coming home and then them understanding that our generation was going to be a nuisance and they needed space for us, the, the baby boom. <clears throat> so in a way yeah. we've come a long way, but there's still room to grow. <laughs> and uh, the issue of you know, the kind of role of women in the architecture school is all, has always been a contested one from the very first graduate, Marjorie Hill, onward. But I just think it's really interesting to think about the kind of class composition at the time when you entered Jerome and when you entered Barry, and the kind of, if you were to look at our student body now, 50-50, uh, 60-40, I mean, the kind of uh, women, female students are real drivers in the school. Uh, the composition of our faculty has transformed radically. Uh, when I started teaching here in 1988, there were actually almost no women teaching in landscape architecture. I think one part-time person, uh, very few women in architecture itself, even though someone like Blanche had been the dean of the school, the presence at the faculty level was almost negligible. So I think we've come a long way, uh, but I think there's definitely improvements to be made. So. Um, so now, so, so you so first year. Well, I'd just like to add something. Nobody's asked what happened to the two girls. Now, what happened to the two women? They graduated. <laughs> in '53, you graduated two, two. In '72, we graduated none. Yeah. So I guess I want to understand what the idea is, the conversation that was going on both at a, in the post-war period and at the time you were at school, Barry. The kind of, you know, there's both the official things that are being delivered by your faculty, and then there's the unofficial, which is your colleagues, the, 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 your classmates, and the things that really interested you and that you were really sort of uh, uh, captivated by. <laughs> I thought you were asking him. What was I captivated by? You should go first. What the ideas, oh. the, the conversation was. I mean, uh, yeah. The Toronto City Hall is 59? The, the announcing of the competition. 50, competition. 58 is the composition, competition. 59 is the building. Uh, and I always think of that as the coming of modernism to Toronto. So you're, you're graduating in 53. But people are still building Georgian buildings on... In, you know, in Toronto, and, and people are still building them now. Yeah, so that's true. <laughs> go figure. Yeah, I do a the other day. Oh man! Yeah, the city hall had, had. There's a little story about it that I remember. Saren, who was on the jury, came a day late. Uh, it goes the story, and uh, he was sitting beside a basket, a waste paper basket, and he looked down at it, and he pulled out piece of paper all wrinkled, yes, it's the, same way. the winning, the building we have today. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. This, is the, this, is the okay. same, so, this is the same era as the Toronto City Hall. I have to say about things like this, that uh, there was an, the people happen to be in the steel business, otherwise <laughs> I, I, I would not have done that sort of thing. Because, you know, generally, personally, I felt we're going along in the, another direction. And you had asked at lunch the other day, who are the uh, well-known influential? That, and I think that's part of your question. Well, certainly it was right um, uh, for so many reasons. Uh, and Mies, who I admired greatly for, for his dogged um, concentration on making things perfect, uh, which is, for a guy like me, it's impossible. But then when you, think about, when you think about the monk residence, I think yeah. of Alto. I mean, I think that for me, it, it has a kind of, the, the amount of mass and plane relative to the kind of yeah. uh, entry point. Uh, I, I see Alto in that. Yeah, well, I, yeah I'm heading there. <laughs> and Corbusier, of course, uh, wonderful architect. But uh, 
I, there was a picture on the cover, I think, of Time magazine. And what is that? It was the little looking up at the little courtyard at, uh, at the in Finland of the scene at Salo, I think it is, George, uh, of that incredibly beautiful little building, humble building, inventive, made of the local materials, wonderful, wonderful place. And uh, Maida and I uh, 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 and some friends went uh, there to see it. And in fact, we wanted to see his cottage. And uh, we went to as far as we could go, and there was just a beach. Where's Mr. Alto's cottage? Over there. You had to go by boat. So, so a farmer lent us a little boat. Uh, what I'm trying I, to I, say I, is, I, I think I got that to drive to it. You what? I, I was able to drive to it. You can't drive to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, you, you can if you, if so you find hour? a fin. If you find oh, he fin, drives over there. Yeah. yeah. You, you put him if in the passenger side, enough. and he'll tell you where to go. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I, if I think of the contemporary architects of that time, uh, certainly Alto, I think, showed us the way. Um, and he, unlike some architects who uh, are making a plastic building, or think they can, I'd like to say, um, his, his free form is always containing the most important part of a building, and he contrasts it with very straightforward um, um, uh, classrooms and whatever he's doing. So you have a simple piece which which has the organic piece which becomes much stronger because there's only one of them. And it's not... You think, if, I don't know if I express that well, yeah. but you know what I mean. Great, great. No, I, I think, I guess I'm trying to understand uh, how, in effect, figures like Alto, so something like the Summer House is a tiny little house situated on a lake, but in a way, uh, it with St. Yitz Sallow are both brick buildings. And that in a way, what's interesting in your trajectory is that these were early projects, uh, really, really exploring modernism in a certain way. And then, in a way, there's a kind of uh, development through, through these buildings to things that are really part of fabric. And using brick as the primary material, which is so Toronto of our place, and in a way, I see, for me, a clear link between a St. Yitz Sallow town hall by Alto and some of the housing projects, both this one and then the St. Lawrence project that we were looking at, because it's using a material uh, to shape, in effect, neighborhoods, parts of cities that really um, don't, uh, kind of aren't about a building that's an object, but a building that really contributes to the life of the city in a really positive way. So it would be great for you to kind of... Well, a couple of things. Um, at St. Lawrence, you can blame me for all that red brick. Um, well, there's buff brick and red brick together, right? So it's, no, uh, no well, this isn't St. Lawrence. He was saying St. Lawrence, you can blame St. Lawrence, right, yeah. Uh, there, um, this is the... Yeah. Uh, it, we were in Toulouse a city entirely of red brick. Where do all we architects go uh, when we want to relax and see beautiful places? We go to the south of uh, France, of Spain, of Italy, and so on. They're all made of, of one material, one. And the entire place is made of one material. And so coming back from red brick to loose, including the cathedral, that mighty is it Toulouse? I think so. Um, uh, I, I, the, the group of our architects met and I, and I started on that theme and for the first half everybody used red brick. So I was trying to uh, keep the city going. Eric Arthur, uh, one of our great professors, who we were all scared of, or certainly I was when I was at school. But finally we got to really care for him, and we have a couple of letters by him. Uh, everybody's read Toronto, no mean city. If you haven't, you should. Um, it's probably out of publication now. But I think, I think that um, streets are disappearing. We're getting spaghetti buildings drop down. There's no, I don't see visual planning. 
I, would, I think that if we lose streets, it, it'd be a terrible thing. Um, and so, you know, we were thinking about streets, the influence of, from Britain of, uh, of, of the uh, architectural magazine, uh, what was it? Uh, architectural Review. Review constantly pounded away at make streets. And, and there was one great artist, architect, who continually um, worked at the um, so, and and I just thought of something before I was talking to people. Uh, the elder Saarinen, um, who who designed Cranbrook Academy, where I met my wife on the first day of the summer we were there. Uh, he said something remarkable. He said, "I always think that he had just died." Uh, the old man, and uh, he said, I always think of the next larger thing, which I've never forgotten. When you start to think about that, you're thinking about oh, cities. Yes. Start with a hand, little door handle, and you go all the way up. And if you think about the whole thing, then you're going to make a better city, I think. And Maybe there's some of that's disappearing. Tell well, us the, what, the, what the discussion was. Uh, there's an interesting way in which your, your work brackets the period of my education, because I said that when I arrived at the university, um, there was a kind of sense of social crisis, the university itself was in crisis, and, and there was a kind of self-reflection on education going on, but also, and I, I don't think it was all that clearly understood by us, modernism was beginning its crisis, and, and really what precipitated it was growing unrest about the impact of uh, particular uh, comprehensive develop comprehensive redevelopment in uh, in central urban situations where you'd end up with plazas supplanting police, uh, street systems, and then uh, tower park systems supplanting neighborhoods, and so um, uh, while we were in school, we were talking about Team Ten, which I see as the beginning of a kind of critical reappraisal of modernism in the university design. Uh, new brutalism was becoming predominant, which was also a kind of critical reappraisal of, of uh, modernity and the problem of durability and materiality and, and so forth. And then, um, uh, so those were going on, and we weren't allowed, by the way, to talk about Frank Lloyd Wright. I, I went through a... a I know. <laughs> That's why I did. We, we, weren't, we weren't even allowed to talk about Mies van der Rohe, but Luc Corbusier, we should have had an altar there's a little room and you could go in and, and when, when you're blue or when, when you couldn't get through in your scheme, you could go in and, 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 and maybe even slaughter sheep or something and, and then Le Corbusier would, would come out at night and help you with your, with your work. Anyway, so one of the things that was going around, along around the school was the, the reform movement. George was involved with that. Jim Larmer who um, was part of this burgeoning uh, new nationalist scene that I was talking about in, in the um, preliminary remarks, uh, was uh, he was publishing books, the city books. Um, he taught a course, which I took at, at the school. Uh, all of that, which was going on around the school and touching fingers into the school, but really wasn't kind of at the center of, of curriculum because we were still in a certain sense, off in Europe, um, <clears throat> subsequently became the, the, uh, the reform movement. And, and these kinds of projects were the result of a reappraisal of the city. And I would say that the, the triumph of people like George was to, per, to be able to pursue a continuity between the modernist project, particularly its interest in, in what George calls morale, and an interest in, uh, in uh, architectural history and um, uh, urban pattern as a kind of generation, uh, as, as a cross-generational project. And that was, I think, the great revolution that happened around the school and to some extent even reaching into the school, but it wasn't really at the center of the kind of uh, discussions in school. Now, we weren't allowed to talk theory either. I mean, <laughs> couldn't talk the history. Couldn't talk. This is the way I perceive it. As I say, oh, I was history. an angry young man, so. 
No so history. Julia, do you think, Barry, um, you know, that shaped the way your, your entire uh, approach to both practice and the city evolved? Well, you know, I, I was interested in finding this fourth year scheme of mine because I was always interested in um, invention, pattern, and intersection between pattern and um, tectonics. And I was quite perplexed when I graduated. And um, I, I can't remember whether it was Bruce, uh, Bruce, John, and Joost Bacher, I think, who's also here. Um, they had already established an association with George where they'd done a, uh, a housing project and, and I think it got an honorable mention. And so that, that really gave, I think, a sense that this group could, um, the, the, next, the next thing would be a winner and before long, you know, one would be transforming Toronto and the whole world. Um, I joined that group and I can't even remember how it happened, but af just after that, and then we did a, a, a competition which was, um, uh, a repackaging of um, John Van Ostrand's thesis scheme before we went on to this kind of, uh, you know, elaborate slate of back porches. But, but, but in a way, Barry, I would say the things that, you know, were published in uh, the Design Quarterly, the kind of projects that uh, uh, the issue that Barton Myers was the editor yes. for and some of the work of George's students at the time have actually been realized. When you look at, you know, the hydro block, in a way, it is a kind of physical manifestation of what was a student project. When I think of Graham and the kind of work that he did, Graham Stewart and his thesis project, looking at you know existing 60s high-rise towers for residential on our periphery, in a way that it's being realized as a kind of way of rethinking this existing fabric that we have and ways of, of recontextualizing them and bringing them into part of a bigger conversation about how we build a new city. And so maybe the kind of, you might begin by thinking that the modernist project is architecture, but maybe the bigger project is the city, and that what I think is really interesting for me is how both of you have contributed to rethinking at different points in time what our city could be. And I just think the kind of question of how, how much of that was, so in a way, like in our lunch time discussion, I guess from, from what you were saying, Jerome, the kind of, the, what you learned in school was, was one thing, but what the discussion amongst your colleagues were was something else. And I would say what I'm hearing from Barry is there was the curriculum at the school, uh, but in a way the real education, the PhD several times over, was really amongst a kind of smaller group with George as actually being um, central to, to a kind of a conversation that, ha that had impact, that had influence in terms of how you could reimagine what, what the fabric of Toronto could be. I, d I don't want to be unfair to the curriculum. I mean, certainly its goal was to encourage critical thinking and innovation. Um, it's just a, its focus, I don't think, was on the problem of urbanism. And it most certainly wasn't facing up to the, the primary problem of the Le Corbusian scheme was confusing scientific management with um, you know, human artifice and culture, which was the city project. And, and that's why I think that, that um, the people at the center of the curriculum, although in a certain sense they're part of this critical appraisal, which I would take Team 10 as being an example of, they, they weren't really you know, addressing these other problems, but on the other hand, they were reaching out to other cultural actors, and so the school was really a kind of cultural firm. I mean, film was very much discussed, and and there were lots of connections that were that were being made. Cultural criticism became part of the of the, the and many of program. the people that you went yeah. to school with became filmmaker. Like they didn't necessarily practice architecture, but they actually entered a whole range yeah. of other disciplines where their design training was actually essential to the way that they saw yeah. the and world. And there were a group of us, I, I can't remember who was involved, I think John Van Ostrom was involved, but there were a number of us who did, uh, who helped John Sewell to do criticisms of the, the Gothic Tower Park scheme that was, uh, that was being proposed north of, um, of um, High Park. Oh, look at that, time's almost up. 
So I guess maybe for both of you, maybe if you had sort of just one or two thoughts for reflecting on your time at the University of Toronto, uh, when it was part of engineering, not even architecture, and then now in effect relative to architecture, landscape, and urban design as the frame that our students actually use to think about the world that we live in. Um, yeah. Um. It's interesting because I think uh, the little group that I was friendly with uh, during school, I think I learned more from them, just from yak fests and all the rest of it, traveling and so on, than from, from, than from the teachers. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, could, I could think of many ways to say it in other ways, but... Uh, uh, that was what it was. There were a couple of people I I liked. Um, I don't know what to say. But um, I mean, for I, for me, know. oh sorry, for me I'll the I think the I mean I came from a, a family in no one had ever gone to university. My my mother didn't read. My father died when I was very young, and and. Um, the, to be involved in an intellectual community, uh, to have access to people that were thinking broadly across an array of disciplines was fantastic. For example, Rick Saluton did this wonderful tribute to Abe Rothstein recently, who, who died quite recently, and uh, I was able to take a, a, an elective course with Abe Rothstein and Michael Bliss, who, was, who became one of the who is a notable Canadian historian, I was able to take courses with these people. And, and so uh, the university answered no question for me, um, but it posed a whole series of questions to follow. And, and one of the reasons I, I posit this sort of proposition of Karam's is that there's a kind of happenstance incidence to one's life that in the context of the university, the people you Karam off are involved with bigger questions and interesting Questions and so the likelihood that they're going to affect your your own intellectual trajectory in a you know stimulating way is much greater than if if you end up working in the auto plant in Oshawa as you know many of my friends did. I, I don't think that there was a Not real. Not there's anything wrong with that. Working in an automobile plant yeah. in Oshawa, except you wouldn't want to live in Oshawa. <laughs> I had a daughter who lived there. A problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, there we was did no... hate the Toronto Maple Leafs. Hmm? We, we hated the Toronto Maple Leafs. No. I, I don't remember a real direction of uh, when I was at school from the teaching people. We had history, it was great. We had Eric Arthur and Tony Adamson. But uh, the, uh, the others, uh, nice people, nice guys, um, uh, they, they all wanted, uh, there was distress on uh, the modern architecture. There was no argument about that. But there was no direction or discussions of the kind. This is one of the things I was surprised about. to learn from Jerry, is that, that modern architecture was really the, the discourse at the time. Because I always thought of Toronto as being very, very late to the party. But I think post-war... Uh, and the training of many of oh, the yes. people from England really would have yeah. set that table. So you weren't even talking about the past. Modernism was the future and, yes. and your yes. world. Yes. So that's really interesting. There was no argument yeah. about that at all. So in a way, I just think for me, it's really great to hear from two amazing uh, architects, educators who contributed such a great deal to the kind of... Uh, ongoing conversation about what our city is. Um, I also think that their time at the University of Toronto uh, in the School of Architecture in each generation, um, I think was really important to their, uh, to the way that they um, really were able to maybe have access to kind of the ideas. So, so what, maybe it's not the, the direct kind of uh, lecture or what you learned one-to-one, -one, but it's being part of an environment, a larger milieu, and, ha and having access to these broader conversations that allow you to recontextualize a building 
at the scale of a neighborhood, at the scale of a city, and actually rethink all of these things. And I guess I would say that the issue of critical thinking is probably the thing that maybe ties both your generation and what you discussed in school and Barry's, and even now to our students here, that we are critical thinkers, and the content is changing and dynamic, but the way of actually approaching every problem and understanding it in this multifaceted way, and the scalar condition, as you talked about, a door handle and a city, both being actually really important and essential as part of the discussion, I think is really, really great. Um, so I would say for me it's been an honor to really, um, you know, uh, moderate this conversation with two heroes, uh, really great uh, uh, contributors. kick off an entire uh, day of celebration. So thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Uh, I think that each of the sessions has been so carefully thought out and planned by the team at the school. They've done an amazing job. And I want you to make sure you come to all of them, but also to enjoy the, 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 the reception, the kind of conversation uh, at the even, in our evening event at the ROM, even though it's in the ROM, it's okay. And, uh, uh, it's in the old part of the ROM, thank goodness, not the new part. You, you, go, you go in the new door. Okay. Uh, but you should also have a look at the exhibition because yes, many yeah. of the issues. Yeah, so, so I think there's, there's the exhibition, there's the rest of the program today, and then the reunion in the evening. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you to both of you for really great insights. Thank you, Bridget. That was great.